Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 33rd meeting of 2018. We have apologies from Shona Robson and Liam MacArthur is delayed due to adverse weather conditions. We thought that was better than saying he was delayed due to wind. Agenda item number one is a decision on taking item seven in private, which is consideration of our forward work programme. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Agenda item two is our fourth evidence session on the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper one, which is note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome the Right Honourable Lady Dorian, Lord Justice Clerk, and Tim Barraclough, Executive Director of the Judicial Office for Scotland. Uh, can I thank you very much for your written evidence, which the committee finds tremendously helpful in advance of us taking formal evidence? Evidence. In addition, can I also thank you for arranging not just one but two visits um, for members of the committee uh, to see the facilities for taking evidence um, by a commissioner and the opportunity to view recordings of commission uh, proceedings. This was, I know, very much appreciated by all the members and very helpful to inform our scrutiny of the bill. Uh, Lady Dorian, I believe you'd like to make a short uh, opening statement. Just a, a couple of minutes, if I may trespass upon your time convener, um, simply to say that I'm very pleased to be here to give evidence on the bill because uh, the bill represents a significant milestone on a journey that I've been personally involved in since 2014 when I was a member of the small group that conducted the initial research leading to the publication of the first evidence and procedure review report in early 2015. Th that started a process of consultation and the development of ideas to devise better ways of taking the evidence of vulnerable witnesses. And from the start and throughout the process, we had the twin objectives that any new measures that we could introduce without legislation should both reduce the potential harm to witnesses and the distress and increase the opportunity to give reliable, accurate and comprehensive evidence. The work that followed the initial report involved all those with an interest in the criminal justice sector. We knew that the best way to get genuinely workable proposals that people from all sides would effectively buy into would be to get them working together to develop them so that um, the working group included representatives of the judiciary, of the faculty of advocates, of the law society, of crown office, justice agencies, third sector organisations uh, representing the interests of children and crime and of course the police. Um, the quality of the collaborative work in each group was very high indeed. And so the practice note that I know that many of you have uh, had sight of um, was very much the work of that collaborative process. Um, the the pre-recorded evidence work stream of uh, the uh, review uh, had two major outcomes. First, paving the way for the practice note, which I've just mentioned, um, designed to use existing legislation uh, and uh, enhance the use of commissioner hearings. That effectively introduced the ground rules hearing, which reference to which is made in the bill to regulate the conduct of commissioner hearings, bring greater consistency and focus on the needs of the witness. It also has led to an increase in the number of commissions, which has enabled us to carry out an evaluative process um, of uh, that work. Um, the working group, as you know, set out a long-term vision for the taking of evidence from all vulnerable witnesses, um, which we recognise could not be achieved overnight. And we recognise that graduated steps along the way to a, a more um, a modern and more consistent approach uh, in the interests of witnesses was going to take time. The bill represents one of the significant staging posts in that journey. Uh, and uh, on that, uh, for that reason, I and my fellow senators um, s generally support the proposals in the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We now move to questions, starting with John Finney. Good morning, panel, and thank you for your work with others on this. Uh, could I um, ask you to expand a bit further, please, Lady Dorian, on uh, when we're talking about the increased use of pre-recorded, and particularly the benefits, um, and uh, I think particularly in terms of the impact on vulnerable witnesses, and the most important 
part as well, uh, or another important part, the quality of evidence obtained. Can you maybe elaborate on both those aspects, please? Yes, I think what really sparked this off for us was uh, looking at a case in which a child of five, I think it was, had given uh, evidence uh, at a trial, having had a joint investigative interview which was played for the evidence in chief, but was cross-examined at the trial. There hadn't been a commission. Uh, and that was some two years or something after the actual um, joint investigative interview and probably quite some time later, maybe three years after the actual complaint had been made. Uh, and we know that in relation to children in particular, if they are asked to give their evidence about something at a time remote from the event, their memory diminishes. And not only does their memory diminish, but they're more likely to uh, be confused by general questioning about the incident uh, and therefore might come across wrongly often in cross-examination as being shifty or unreliable. Uh, and not only are they, um, do they find it difficult to deal with the, the questions at that stage, they are more inclined just to agree with the questioner when they can't remember uh, as well. So the idea of a, a commission at a much closer period in time to the incidents of which they are complaining uh, was clearly something that would enhance their ability to recall, to give accurate and comprehensive evidence, uh, and of course also reduce the harm to them because then they can get on with their lives and they do not need to attend the trial, and so everything else can carry on, as it were, without them. So, what, the specific example you referred to there, what was the impact on the child of being cross-examined, are you able to say? I would, have to, I would have to refer to the details of the case. I think the child did have difficulty answering the questions in any meaningful way. And my recollection, again, I would really have to check this, but my recollection is the child was not able to give any meaningful evidence in cross-examination. Conversely, then, are there problems associated with taking this particular route, I think, with regard to safeguards to prevent any um, miscarriages of justice? What safeguards do you believe should be built into the process? Well, the safeguards which apply are essentially the same safeguards which would apply if the child was giving evidence at the trial. The, the commissioner is a High Court judge, um, invested with the same powers as a High Court judge. Um, the commissioner is in control of the proceedings. If there are difficulties in the way of the questioning, the, the commissioner can deal with them. But <coughs> equally, the commissioner is there to protect the interests of the accused as well, in the same way as the judge at trial would be. Really, all this does, apart from the, the other issue of simplifying the questions, which is another issue, brings the, it brings the process forward, really. I, I don't see any real difficulties along the, um, of the issue that you're raising if subsequent subsequent to the commissioning of, of the, the the statement from the, the further evidence comes to light how was that dealt with well if if something further came to light that really required the child to be further examined and you have to bear in mind that very often the nature of the cross-examination of children in these cases is very limited to suggest that either the events didn't happen or perhaps a, that someone else might have been to blame, someone else, possibly someone else, visiting the family or something. Um, so, first of all, the question would arise whether it was actually necessary for this material to be uh, addressed in cross-examination or examination in chief of the child. If so, then a further commission could be held. But may I say that in the period of time since we introduced the practice note, and in the evaluation that we've had of the uh, results of that, which have seen a 50% a increase in commissions, admittedly from a low level start, we have not ever encountered a situation where something has subsequently come to light that required to be addressed in that way. And as regards to, thank you, the, 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 the specific legislation, um, do you have views on having a requirement to period record evidence built in, categories or? Well, certainly for young children, um, and children generally, I think that uh, a requirement to pre-record the evidence is, uh, is absolutely the way forward. Uh, in due course, uh, I think that that is something that could usefully be extended to uh, other vulnerable witnesses. But of course, uh, 
There are resource implications of doing this, and it's important to make sure that we get it right for children before we move on um, further with other categories, I would say. OK, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Rona. Thank you, <coughs> convener. Good morning. Um, yes, I'd just like to pick you up on a wee bit on the last point that was raised there about phased implementation to other um, witnesses. Can I ask what your view is on the fact that it now is, is restricted to children in the most serious cases? and whether you think and how it could be rolled out to children generally appearing in the sheriff court, etc. Well, in, in our um, review, where we, we came, um, where we recommended a particular um, approach to be taken, we recognised in that that a phased implementation of change was going to be necessary. And we felt that probably the best way of starting was with children who are amongst the most vulnerable of the witnesses that we, we would have to deal with. Uh, and also that there was sense in limiting it to the High Court, actually, um, not just to solemn cases, uh, in order to make sure that the model that developed, because bear in mind we were, we were developing a model of practice which did not require legislation, and this was new. And in order to make sure that it developed in a, a careful, managed, consistent way, we felt it was more important to limit it to those most serious cases where children are giving evidence, and these are mostly you know, pretty serious uh, cases of abuse, which will be dealt with in the High Court. Uh, and uh, our, our view was it was very important that we got it right for these children and that the danger of expanding it too quickly across the country was that we would have less consistency in the operation of it um, and also it would be harder for us to evaluate what was working and what wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And can I ask how, I know you'll not be able to say exactly, but how long you think it might take to evaluate that, that first phase? Well, we've done our second evaluation report uh, and we have, uh, as a consequence of that, um, we have identified some issues that we need to look at. Some of them are technical in relation to the, the, the nature of the filming and what gets displayed on the um, uh, screen. Some of them relate to the uh, issue of controlling the questions and uh, how that should be done and so on. And so at the moment, the practice note is definitely a, an evolving document, as it were, because we will be revising uh, whether we need to look at changing any elements of it as a consequence of the, that evaluation. It's quite difficult to say how long it might take Are to feel comfortable. That you envisage to be um, relatively easy to resolve? Or? Yes, yeah. yes. They're not huge series? No, they're, they're, they're not. There they're, they're are things to do with technical aspects of the use of the equipment, sometimes to do with the, the rooms where the uh, commission takes place, and to do with the control of the questioning, which is something that with which we're in negotiation with the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society at the moment. Yeah. And um, are you in favour in time of rolling it out into other adult vulnerable witnesses? I am, yes. Yeah. And that, so that would be the eventual aim once everything else is moving smoothly? Yes. OK. Thank you. Jenny, and then we'll do supplementaries from Liam Kerr and Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. And just as a follow-on from Rona Mackay's line of questioning with regard to um, adult vulnerable witnesses, I wonder if the panel might have a view with regard to domestic abuse um, cases specifically, because I appreciate, Lady Dorian, you, you, you said that in due course it will be extended to other vulnerable witnesses. Do we now need to consider domestic abuse witnesses next as, a, as an example of, of adult vulnerable witnesses? Well, I'm using the term vulnerable witness in the sense in which it's currently defined by the legislation. Obviously, it's a matter for the Parliament to determine whether um, the, the uh, definition of vulnerable witness should be e expanded in any mm -hmm. way. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. Supplementary, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Just on that point, if I may, the, um, you say, Lady Dorian, that uh, it's a matter for Parliament to extend, and I think I'm right in saying that the, uh, that extension will be done by regulations. Uh, do you take a view on whether uh, having regulations to extend that jurisdiction is appropriate or whether that would actually make it too easy, too straightforward and without sufficient scrutiny to extend the scope? 
Well, there are two separate things, I think, involved in the, in, in the questioning. The answer I was giving uh, was in relation to the statutory definition of the vulnerable witness. Mm -hmm. And so my um, view on that was that if, if that definition is to be altered, that would have to be a matter for Parliament, and it would be a matter for the, the Parliament to decide whether the definition should be changed. Uh, so far as, and of course, it will at the moment encompass certain uh, witnesses who are... Um, complainers in domestic abuse cases, but it, it doesn't cover as a, you know, automatically. Um, the question, so, so that's the definition of vulnerable witness. The, the issue of whether the uh, process in the bill should be extended to other vulnerable witnesses beyond children, i.e. those who are defined in statute as vulnerable witnesses. Um, I, I personally don't see any difficulty with that being the subject of regulation, um, so long as any extension of the definition of vulnerable witness is done in the knowledge that, th that this could be the consequence. Mm. Uh, but I do understand that some people um, feel that, that uh, the extension by regulation is not a, a, an adequate safeguard, but, mm. and that's something obviously that the, the committee will have to grapple with. Thank you. Can I just, before Daniel comes in, ask you a little bit more about the definition of vulnerable in vulnerable witnesses. We had evidence from miscarriage of justice and they suggested that vulnerable wasn't clear and it tended to be looking at the offence and categorising someone as vulnerable automatically rather than looking at the, the person in front of us. Well, there are two... There are two separate uh, issues here. One is that, um, that though there is a, a category of vulnerable witness which relates to the offence um, in relation to which the, uh, the trial is to take place. Mm -hmm. uh, equally, a, a witness can be a vulnerable witness if it is um, shown that they um, would require to have special measures in order to give their evidence um, more fully and if they are apprehensive or um, otherwise uh, would be scared or intimidated from doing so, uh, if they didn't have um, if, they, if they didn't have that measure, and clearly that kind of approach is one which is more of a model um, designed to assess the individual vulnerability of the witness as opposed to whether they are uh, complaining of a particular offence having been committed. So do you think that needs um, just more um, explanation in the policy memorandum just to, to make I, that absolutely clear? I, I, I don't think there's any I don't think there's any difficulty actually in, in at the moment identifying who who would qualify as a vulnerable witness. Uh, and on the face of it, I think the the um, provision that enables someone to be uh, classified as a vulnerable witness if they would find it difficult to give their evidence without special measures because they are apprehensive um, and uh, feel uh, under threat is probably sufficient. I don't have the statute in front of me, unfortunately, so I can't be uh, quite precise, quite precise. Yeah. the I'll, terminology. I'll maybe return to um, definitions later. Daniel. So I'd just like to carry on the, 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 some of the questions regarding uh, the extensions in, uh, that, that are provided for in the bill. Um, and as I understand it, in the first instance, it will apply to children and to specific um, uh, uh, types of case. That can be extended by uh, regulation. However, it, it's, it's, it's essentially my understanding is that it stops short of, of make, making it possible uh, for all types of cases in all courts um, and I'm just wondering whether or not, in your view, the bill should go further and, and certainly make that a, a possibility so we don't need to return uh, to primary legislation uh, you know, in, in, in the, the, the course of time as this evolves and as we seek to extend the, the, this provision for other types of witness and other types of cases. Well, uh, ultimately, the question of extending to other courts, uh, to say some sheriff court, solemn and sheriff court summary business is a question of resources largely um, mm -hmm. as well as being satisfied that we have a model which is clear and consistent w once there is a model which is clear and consistent there is no reason other than resource implications for that not to be extended to other courts um, so uh, in a way as long as the resources are available there would there would seem to be no difficulty in extending that by regulation 
Uh, and in fact, there were probably, uh, there, there's probably a better and easier argument for doing that than for extending the categories. To, to, uh, to that, um, the, just to be clear, that this facility of taking evidence by a commissioner is available across the and does happen at yes. every level already. It's a question whether the presumption should apply or not to a wider range of witnesses. And in the evidence and procedure work that was done, it was recognised you needed to take a proportionate approach, and the um, pre-recorded evidence document talked about different approaches for different levels of seriousness and different levels of court. Um, for one example, you know, at the other extreme, for a proportionate response, we were saying you don't really need a complex process for, say, a, an articulate 16-year-old who's witnessed a bicycle theft. It's not, they're not going to need, that's not, by definition, they're vulnerable, but they're not necessarily going to need a lot of special measures for them to provide their evidence. So it's just to make sure that we took a proportionate approach, and as we extend it, that proportionality still, still applies. Yes, that, that, that's a, that is an important point, I think, and it is worth noting also that at the moment, uh, other witnesses other than children, um, uh, if their, uh, their, their needs of communication or their um, ability to give their evidence re requires it, they can also give evidence by commission as, uh, at the moment. So the real question is the issue of making it essentially the, the main method of giving evidence. And there are, as Tim says, proportionality issues about that in the lower courts, particularly in the summary court. Can I maybe just draw it a little bit in terms of the, the, the resource requirement in order to, to make this uh, feasible? I mean, what, what are the resources that, 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 that we are looking at and what would be necessary for extension? Is this about uh, facilities? Is it about recording equipment? Is it about training for individuals? If you could just maybe just elaborate well, on what the resource requirements are. If you, if you have a system where um, the evidence of all vulnerable witnesses, for example, just to um, expand it to that, all vulnerable witnesses in the High Court have um, their evidence captured in uh, co commission form, then that has significant resource implications for the police and for the Crown uh, in how they go about uh, gathering the evidence, what, uh, what they do in preparation for the um, way in which that evidence is going to be captured in due course, particularly since with children the standard way of capturing their evidence in chief is in the joint investigative interview and that would be, that would continue. So the main resource implications really are at that front end. There are then resource implications for the court because um, for, for every commission you would have to have a ground rules hearing. Um, you would ha then have, uh, and these can, they can take, uh, if, if you're looking at assessing the nature of the questions to be asked, they can take some time. Uh, so there are quite significant resource implications from the point of view of the, the court's programme of building in time for the ground rules hearing and then building in time for the commission, particularly when the commissioner is a High Court judge. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Jenny. Um, I'd just like to focus a wee bit more on taking evidence by commissioner. Um, Lady Doreen, at, at the start you pointed out a 50% increase in taking evidence on commission uh, since the practice note was introduced. Are there any issues currently in terms of the practicalities, for example, the use of technology, um, or increasing this any further? Uh, well, um, there, there, there are a number of practical issues which exist at the, at the moment. Um, there is a is very very important to make sure that the equipment which is used up and down the country is consistently the same equipment, mm -hmm. operating the same um, systems, and uh, that there is this consistency across the country. Some uh, issues arise about using particular premises for commissions, and at the moment. We have largely been using court premises for, mm -hmm. not court rooms, but yeah. court premises, um, because it enables us to keep control over the nature <coughs> of the equipment which is being used. Once we start using more remote sites, and of course we're 
keen to do so when we can, but at the moment there are difficulties about that because we have less control over the nature of the equipment that is available and so on. So there are certain issues about that and of course for remote sites there are also issues of security and safety. Mm -hmm. Um, the committee's previously taken evidence um, from an example of a child having to give evidence 24 times um, from, a, from a children's charity, actually, who brought this evidence to the committee. And uh, as a result, the evidence was then ruled inadmissible because the child had had to go through this process um, so many times. And, and I appreciate, Lady Dorian, at the start, you talked about children's memory diminishing the further away they get from the event. Um, is there an opportunity in the legislation to expedite the process, um, particularly for children, to get this done more quickly? Well, I'm very glad to see that the bill does contain provision for that because mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, we were uh, concerned about was that although we could, by our practice note, encourage the use of commissions for children and uh, try to encourage people to apply for the commission at as early a stage in the proceedings in the High Court as possible, it could not be done until at the very earliest the service of the indictment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, we were quite keen to see some means by which that could be expedited. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm very pleased to see that the bill does contain that possibility that a commission could actually take place before the service of an indictment. And, and lastly then, perhaps is there an opportunity with regard to the use of ground rules uh, hearings to, for the legislation perhaps to specify you know, at an earlier stage what is required as an opportunity there? You mean within the what, what should the take commission. place at a grand yeah. uh -huh. hearing? You mean? Yeah. Um, I, I I don't actually think there is a requirement for that mm. in the legislation. Um, we have quite detailed um, recommendations in our our practice note as to what should take place at the uh, at the grand rules hearing. You'll find them if you're interested in uh, paragraph eleven of the practice notes, about two pages, yeah. and. But because, as I was saying earlier, because this is a document which will be under review, we will be able to change these mm -hmm. as and when it appears that something else would assist. Um, and uh, I think that the flexibility that can be um, maintained by having these set out in the ground rules hearing would actually be much more beneficial than trying to put it into primary legislation, which would be much more difficult to change. Thank you. Rona. Thank you. Yes, can I ask you about um, the role of intermediaries, um, court intermediaries such as in used in England, and whether you think that this should, they should be provided for within this bill to happen here? Well, we are uh, generally in favour of the use of intermediaries where their um, uh, assistance would enable a witness to give their evidence in a, in a more comprehensive and more... Um, uh, in a clearer way uh, and where the communication needs of the witness make that necessary. Um, very often um, with, with children, that will, the, the use of an intermediary is not necessarily what is required. Simple questions, one, um, one issue per question, things of that nature can usually be sufficient to address the communication needs of children. There will, of course, be cases where an intermediary would be of great assistance. Um, so whilst we're in favour of intermediaries um, in general, um, whether this is the stage to try to introduce them into the bill, I'm not entirely sure. Um, the other issue, of course, is that um, we do not at the moment have a base of intermediaries. We don't have a cadre of intermediaries uh, who could be called upon to provide that service. And I think that would be another complication um, which would perhaps hinder uh, progress at this stage. Okay. Thank you. Photo. <coughs> Good morning, panel. Um, Lady Dorian, you spoke, spoke earlier about the, the use of uh, joint investigative interviews. How, how often are they used as evidence in chief in uh, is it a regular occurrence? And what's the practical difficulties with, with their use? Well, um, with, with children uh, and um, the, the joint investigative interview is frequently uh, the way in which the evidence of children is gathered for um, 
their evidence in chief. Um, if the, there are um, care issues as well as uh, criminal justice issues, there will be a joint investigative interview. And where there's a commission, then generally the evidence in chief is taken to be the evidence of the joint investigative interview, and that will be played in due course to the jury at the trial. Mm. Um, and so it happens on a, on a regular basis. Um, the issue of the content of joint investigative interviews is something that one of our work groups looked at. Um, I wasn't actually involved in that work group, so um, Tim might be able to give you more information about that. But we did recognise, and we in our work group about um, recommending a different vision, we recognised that central to what we had in mind would be a necessary improvement of the quality of joint investigative interviews. And there does still seem to be an issue, even from the point of view of the commission process, that um, the quality of joint investigative interviews is not as consistent as one would like to see. So, so that was something that, that, that we'd heard in uh, previous sessions, was that the, the joint investigative interviews are used as the, as the primary means of gathering evidence uh, from children. Um, but, uh, and and as, uh, I should declare as a previous social worker myself, I was involved in, in joint investigative interviews. But what, what I was interested in was uh, we heard that there was uh, often inconsistency in the, the quality of evidence that, that could be taken to court. So is there any stats, I don't know if you've got any stats on joint investigative interviews taking place and then how many of them end up in court? And I apologise if that's a, a question that you don't have the answer to here just now. I, um, <coughs> I, th when the working group that was looking at looked at it, it was hard to get absolutely clear stats, but the feeling was that I think an estimate was that around 5,000 joint investigative interviews were taking place per year. It was in the thousands, but that a vast majority of those never ended up in criminal okay. proceedings, because remember, they have more than one purpose. It's about finding out whether there are protection issues, and they may reveal nothing that needs to be taken further. So it, it was a, a small percentage of the overall number of JIIs that actually ended up in criminal proceedings. Um, and remember again, very often, even if criminal proceedings do start, you don't necessarily get to trial. Mm. There's a big fall off in cases that start and then, uh, because the accused pleads guilty or, or for whatever reason. Yeah, I would say with respect that I, I doubt very much whether um, that would be a meaningful statistic yeah, okay. because, because um, the, um, the percentage of overall JIIs that end up in court is not, I don't mm. think, a measure of the quality or success of that uh, gather information gathering process. Well, would a more meaningful statistic then be um, where the, the, the GII had um, identified that there should be a prosecution, however, the quality of the GII didn't allow for the prosecution to take place? Does that make sense? Well, if there were cases in which, for example, <clears throat> the, the, the the, the Crown had decided that they could not proceed, for example, on the basis of a, yeah. a JII, that would be a more meaningful okay. statistic. Um, uh, bearing in mind that um, the, the decision wouldn't be made simply on the quality of one piece of evidence because there would be the issues of corroboration and so on. So again, the Crown might have a JII <coughs> in a case and not proceed on the basis of an inadequate sufficiency of evidence as opposed to anything else. There are measures that one could look at, and that's, that's one of them, but you would probably have to look at more than one measure, for example. You could, you could try to ascertain the extent to which uh, JIIs had been the subject of objection to the quality of them or the use of leading questions and so on. I'm not actually uh, aware of that being a significant issue um, but that is another element that could be looked at. Okay, that, 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 that's really helpful. But moving on from that, in terms of training, both social work and the police have, have been in front of us in previous uh, panels and have talked about the, um, that they're looking at new training techniques for the, the GIIs. Is there anything that you think should be included in that training um, in relation to prior statements from, from your point of view? Well. We did have, as I say, a report on the use of JIIs 
that set out very clearly, I think, what we recommended um, should be the way forward for the, the um, training of both social workers and police officers in the taking of that. Again, I wasn't on that work stream, so if you want yep. more information, perhaps Tim could supply okay. it. Um, yes, the, as, as you rightly recognise, it was recognised um, by the group that there was a lot of inconsistency and variation in the quality of JIs across the piece, um, and that the two main things that were required to improve that consistency and quality was one, better equipment, the technology had to be improved, because I think that was very out of date. But secondly, the point you raise of a common approach, because there are very different approaches in different parts of the country, a common approach to the training, forensic interviewing. Um, there's a, a, a lot of academic research out there into different ways of interviewing uh, children forensically. Um, that is where some of the information um, from the Barnhouse experience also was very useful. We have experts, um, we had experts both in Scotland and in the wider UK who could give advice. And I understand, although um, you know, I think it would be for Police Scotland to, to give the actual details, that they are changed quite in the process of changing the approach to training at the moment. Uh, when we were looking at it, training was a, a, a one week course that they did for four days and sort of practiced their interviews um, at the end of that week. Uh, I think it has to be over a much longer period. And alongside that, I think one of the other things that was picked up was very important is, provided the interviewers are properly trained in forensic interviewing, according to the recognised models, and then that they practised it on a regular basis in real life, that's when the quality, because some of the quality issues were coming through where you had a large number of police officers and social workers who were trained in it, but were only doing it once or twice a year, so they couldn't keep up the skills and develop their skills and were not evaluated. So you need to have evaluation, you need to have regular practice, as well as the, core, the initial training being a high enough quality. Okay. Uh, so uh, thanks very much for the, those answers. That's a, a, a wee bit um, off topic in, in, from what I was talking about there. And going back a wee bit to uh, the extension, if um, you talked about the extension to other vulnerable witnesses um, earlier and answers to colleagues, I was interested in the, uh, the Scottish Government's decision not to extend the rule to a child accused. Uh, have you got any view on that, uh, Lady Doreen? Well, uh, first of all, I should say that uh, I think that, that, that there are, there are um, the, the, the current legislation provides that a number of special measures would be available to a child accused from the giving of evidence. Yeah. Uh, the the um, probably most appropriate one would be giving evidence by CCTV from somewhere remote um, from the, not actually in the courtroom, because the experience of, it's one thing from sitting, listening to the trial um, to uh, in, in the presence of the jury, it's another thing going into the witness box and giving evidence there and then with the jury in the same room. And uh, it, it may well be that that is a measure which is currently underused in relation to both children, young people and other vulnerable witnesses. The issue of, I noticed that some people have raised the issue of the capturing, somehow capturing the evidence of a child accused before trial and I'm afraid I can't see how that could uh, ever be done. The, um, the accused, whether a child or otherwise, um, is not required to give evidence and the decision about whether they give evidence uh, has to be made in the context of what the evidence at the trial has been and you do not know what that will be until the end of the trial because although you might anticipate that the evidence will be A, B and C very frequently that turns out not entirely to be accurate uh, and the accused has to respond to what the evidence has been <clears throat> at the trial. Um, uh, and I, I can't really see a way in which it could be done in advance and I think it, I, I can't also see how uh, it wouldn't be um, uh, in breach of uh, the rights of a, an accused child to require them somehow to do that. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that very helpful answer and I suppose um, my, my own personal opinion is, uh, is uh, another bill. Um, and the age of criminal responsibility goes through the Parliament um, is that we should be moving away from child being, seeing children as perpetrators. 
personal Do you thoughts. Do you see it another bill? <laughs> <laughs> Rune. Oh, sorry, Daniel, you've got a uh, supplementary. Just a brief one in terms of the quality point. How, how frequently is the, 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 are technical issues the, the, the factors which impinge on quality of JI and actually by extension uh, in terms of what has been happening in, in, in recent times with commissioned evidence? How frequently do technical issues actually impact on the quality of the evidence or even render it uh, unusable in court? I'm not aware of technical issues that have rendered it unusable right. in court, um, but we have had technical interviews, uh, technical issues that um, make the make the evidence um, perhaps well. The, the the evidence could have been perhaps captured on film in a way that was easier to follow. Perhaps um, it, it's really more to do with. Uh, th because especially if you have a remote site, if you have a, a child giving evidence at a commission, um, but doing so by CCTV, for example, mm -hmm. then you have issues of who is seen on the screen when. Uh, and uh, sometimes the, the if end result is that um, the child is not given as much prominence on the screen as one might would wish to see. That's something that we are very much de addressing at the moment, making to try to make sure that these kind of technical issues um, do not get in the way of the evidence. So, so, so just again briefly, does that imply that there's the requirement for uh, te detailed technical standards, both for commissioned evidence and indeed for JIIs, to ensure consistency and, and, and quality from that technical perspective? Is that something that would be sensible to develop? Well. Certainly, from the point of view of what we are looking at, we are looking at, I think, trying to get some kind of overall consistent standard of what what a commission um, film looks like. Um, again, the issue of specifying something in the legislation has with it the difficulties that, as technology increases, which it does at a much faster rate than um, than the legislation might be able to follow, yeah. um, it I, wouldn't perhaps be. No, I wasn't implying that I, we, we should put technical standards no. on the face of the bill. It was more. But certainly, a, the a, development a of them. Yeah, point. no, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, that, uh, j just to say, um, within the court estate, there has very recently been a substantial amount of investment in the technology, mm -hmm. such that I don't think we have any particular concerns about the quality of recording and playback and video audio using the technology that we now have uh, um, available to us in, uh, across the court estate. Um, the issue I think you were talking about is JIIs, there will be yeah. greater variability because there'll be different um, different people uh, providing that, that equipment. Um, so, and remember the Joint Investigative Vintu is a, is a pre-court procedure, yes. so we don't have a huge amount of influence on how those are conducted. That's more a matter for local authorities and, and the police, but we would like to see improved, consistent quality because it just makes the, every, everything that follows easier. That's yeah. very helpful, thank you. I, I, can I just endorse that? <laughs> that that uh, we would very much like to see an improved and consistent quality of recording uh, in relation to the JIIs. Okay, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Very briefly, I'd like to just go back to Fulton McGregor's point about the child accused, if I might. Uh, I totally understand the point being made, Lady Dorian, about the logistical um, and, and indeed the, the justice aspects of not extending this to uh, child accused. Full stop, I get that. Uh, I also, though, see that in the review, there was a conclusion that the most comprehensive, reliable and accurate evidence is maximised by a process similar to this. Uh, and also, uh, earlier on, you said in your opening statement, I think, that uh, a child is more likely to agree with a questioner. Uh, and if that's right, there's, a, there's an inherent tension between those two positions. And if that's right, then isn't the answer to Fulton McGregor's question that, that there is more to be said around how we improve the evidence uh, and the ability uh, to, to get justice for a child accused? Well, I, I think, you, you know, that you have to bear in mind what the, what the 
what the process is in relation to uh, a child accused. The child accused has no um, no need to answer anything, no need to, to give any evidence at all. Um, and uh, there, I think there, there would be significant um, issues in trying to create a situation where you somehow required a child accused to answer the uh, uh, allegations prior to any kind of a trial. I think there would be very significant constitutional issues in relation to that. Um, I'm not sure that I can say any more about it at, at this stage because it, it's not really part of what I was uh, anticipating uh, to be the remit of the uh, this morning's discussion. The issue of the, the technology, are you satisfied or um, uh, confident that the SETS budget for 2019-20 will be sufficient to have the necessary resources for the technology you require? In order to deal with the uh, use of commissions for children, mm -hmm. um, we, I think we're satisfied that we have the equipment. Um, we are restricted in the use of um, places at the moment. We have a room in uh, Parliament House, which the committee or most of them have seen. Mm -hmm. um, it's not ideal. Um, we are looking at other options, um, and that, of course, is likely to be resource dependent. Um, we have uh, a very good facility coming on stream in Glasgow at yeah. Atlantic Key, as I think you all will also know. Um, and in due course, we will have a good facility in the Highlands when the Inverness Justice Centre comes on board. Um, but the, uh, if there is a vision that um, the commissions should be able to take place more widely across the country and be less focused on court buildings, then that would be another issue. And um, I don't know, Tim might have something to uh, add about that. The direct answer to your question is yes, we are confident that we have the uh, facilities being brought on stream in place that will cope, certainly in the short to medium term, with the increase in commissions that are likely to take place. Um, the Glasgow facility, um, we expect, will we'll have three commission rooms that will be dedicated. They will, it is not in a court building, it's in a, in a separate building, so it doesn't have the, um, the difficulties associated with doing things in court buildings. Um, and it, operating at a, a reasonably high, not full capacity, um, could cope with something like a thousand commissions a year. Mm -hmm. So um, that will be the, the, the centre. We would therefore look to upgrade facilities uh, elsewhere across the country, as Lady Doring was saying. So in the short to medium term, we are certainly confident that we have uh, the facilities in place and also that we would have the people uh, in place to be able to manage those facilities and the judiciary as well. I Looking a little bit further than that, yeah. as you expand the uh, uh, availability of commission hearings to other categories of witness, I think we would just keep in constant dialogue with the Scottish Government, who so far have been very supportive um, in providing, for example, the resource for the Glasgow Centre. Mm -hmm. um, and they have indicated that they would obviously be very keen to be as supportive as they can be going forward. So, as I say, for the short to medium term, we see no problems with that. Yeah. I think the committee would welcome being updated as, as you progress about the resource issue because it is so very key to um, ensuring, hopefully, that this is all going to work well and be successful. Rona. Yes, um, just really on the, the subject of facilities, the committee recently had a trip to Norway and we visited the Barna House, and I think it's fair to say we were all very impressed with it. Is this something you see us moving to in Scotland in the future at any point? And if you do, what are the benefits and what would be the practicalities or the, the downside of it? Well, um, the, as you know, the Barnhouse system operates slightly differently in all the countries which, which operate it, uh, adapted to their own requirements. We set out uh, our, our own vision of, of how a, a forensic interview of a child might take place, um, which was... Um, designed to meet the particular um, circumstances of our own system. And we suggested that there should be a forensic interview of the child. Obviously, that was something that would require much greater training and 
so on from the point of view of the JII and uh, a much, much, much different kind of approach. Um, and the idea behind that was that there would be minimal involvement of, of lawyers. Um, and so, well, essentially, that was our view of how we could take some of the best aspects of the uh, Barnhus model and use it. Uh, and I think we would have envisaged that that would take place in uh, centres where there were also the other facilities available for the child, medical or uh, social work facilities, um, which would assist. Um, but that's a it's, a it's a very different vision to the one which uh, which is in the bill, and uh, as we recognised in our um, report, achieving a vision of that kind is a very long term strategy because it it does require so much uh, of a cultural change and so much of a change in the form of the nature of the forensic interview that takes place. I think we we saw how it could work in an adversarial system in, in Norway, which is, is, as you say, is different in, in, in other countries. Um, so I just ask you again, in the long term, do you think it would be possible to happen in Scotland? In terms of the, of the vision that we have suggested, um, we think it, it would work in that way. It could work in that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Barclough, do you have any thoughts on well, that? Well, uh, just to add, um, we've seen and um, visited a number of barn houses in different countries that, as Lady Doran says, all slightly different. Yeah. Um, just two comments. One, the core idea of a barn house being a centre where there is a number of facilities to receive a child or other vulnerable witness who is reporting uh, a serious offence is one that could be used today uh, in Scotland within the context of a really good place to have a joint investigative interview but the legal system would still then have a evidence by commission hearing later on. So the, the idea of a barn house as a, a very good space for interviewing children can be developed now. But yes, and the long-term vision was for the right kind of cases, because it's a very resource-intensive procedure. The, the, the vision set out in one of the reports does say, yes, for those kinds of cases, you could move to something, but it would, as Lady Doran says, mean changing the whole legal system as well as the facilities available. It's, it's, it's much more than just building facilities and having certain people there. It's changing the culture because it takes lawyers out of the direct questioning of the witness, which is alien to the way that things have been done here. For yeah. so long. I mean, I think that was one of the things that impressed us, that, that the, um, the lawyers went to the child, the professionals went to the child rather than the child coming to, to them. And, and that was one of the... And it was very holistic. And I think that was one of the things that we very impressed by, so um, we will wait and see. <laughs> Lots of as we can, Kate, and, and, and introduce as best we can, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, could I ask about communication? It's a theme that's, that's come through um, the evidence sessions that we've had so, so far, particularly with vulnerable witnesses, and also how much support is given to them before, during, and crucially, something I don't think it's addressed in the bill is, is after they have given evidence and there's been a conviction. Uh, a conviction. Well, from the point of view of the court, um, our involvement... Stops. It, well, it also doesn't start until they become a witness within the court system. So from the point of view of the um, support that may be available for them in, in advance, that's something that really needs to be discussed with the police and the Crown. Um, our objective is to make sure that when they are giving their evidence, that they are given the best circumstances in which they can do so. And that uh, if that requires them to uh, have uh, screens to give evidence on CCTV, to have a supporter present, uh, to uh, have a commission to take their evidence, then that will be done. And our, our focus is to, be make, to make sure that the representatives who, who seek to lead a vulnerable witness, and it may not always be the Crown, it may be the defence, that they are... Uh, that they have to think about what the requirements of the witness are, what the communication needs are, and everything else. Advise the court of that in the vulnerable witness notice, and the court will then 
specify anything else that requires to be done to assist that process. However, after that, again, they move out of the court system and the question of what support then may be available for them seems to me to be more of a, a therapeutic issue in respect of which the court has no involvement, nor does it have the skills or expertise to be able to address those kind of issues. Um, and, uh, and I think there would also be constitutional issues um, were it to be suggested that the court should be involved in that. I, I understand that fully, but obviously you're very passionate about this, Lady Doran, and you want it to succeed, as we all do. And uh, I suppose a recent um, case that's come to, to, to my notice has suggested that if there isn't that support later on, this is looking not from the judiciary's point of view, but the whole legislation as a whole, then it could almost get to the state where the vulnerable witness is saying, if only I hadn't given evidence, I would still be able to um, follow my career and, and not be rejected because uh, I've been traumatised. Um, I wouldn't be defiled by my very close community. And um, my family wouldn't be facing um, horrendous <coughs> problems, um, both with where they're living and doing. So there is an issue here that, you know, if the, the word goes out, you give evidence, that's fine, you get the conviction, but there are repercussions, then there's a real danger we're not um, giving the, the support and encouragement and confidence for people to come forward. Well, one of our objectives in, in um looking at the ways in which the witnesses give evidence is to try to minimise the harm involved in the process of giving evidence. Yeah. Yeah. If there is the risk of harm to the witness from having given evidence, then clearly that is something that, 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 that should be addressed. But it requires to be addressed, I think, out with the, the, the court yes, service. Yes. Yeah, understand that totally. Yes, uh, Tim's just reminded me, of course, that the, the, um, the recently constituted victims task force um, may well be addressing those kind of issues. Um, and uh, the, the Lord Advocate, I think, is possibly co-chair of that. So um, the, the, um, that, that might be a more suitable um, forum to address the issue. Yeah. When the Cabinet Secretary comes in, I think perhaps that's a question for him. Um, can I ask just a little bit more about definitions? I see um, that you, you consider there should be a definition for solemn proceedings. You think that would be helpful in the bill in your written um, submission, was that right? Could you just uh, remind me of a... It was page five in notes. Uh, I, I think... Oh, right, solemn cases, it was suggested that um, there could be... We wonder, therefore, whether a provision of definition of solemn proceedings would be beneficial in the context where a child witness is giving evidence, evidence in the relevant criminal proceedings. Are solemn proceedings, and I think later on there's a reference to it. There's no definition of solemn cases in the bill, and it's not yes. clear. Yes. Yeah, in the top of page six. Yes, uh, th this is really to do with... Th th this is... It's a slightly technical issue, as you will appreciate, because um, uh, the uh, proceedings are taken to have commenced when the indictment or the complaint is served on the accused. And uh, therefore, um, the question of when there are solemn, solemn proceedings as opposed to proceedings mm -hmm. um, would uh, currently, you would only be sure that you had solemn proceedings when an indictment was served because a petition, uh, which is how you commence initially uh, solemn proceedings, pro um, proceedings on petition can be reduced to summary complaint. So um, you would not be able to say that that meant there were solemn proceedings. Um, and so simply from the point of view of being able to utilise the suggestion in the bill that we could have a commission at a much earlier stage, yes, it, it would probably be of assistance. Yeah. There were two other definitions, again, from previous evidence that um, it was from MOG, the uh, miscarriages of justice that they thought could be looked at, definition for ground rules and um, a definition of permissible, permissible lines of questioning. 
I thought that was vague. Do you, do you think that needs further um, clarification? I, I, I don't, actually, um, because the Grand Rules hearing is what takes place as um, the, is the, the, uh, the hearing at which the uh, organisation of the Commission is discussed. And I think it's quite, it's, it, it, it's well understood now what is involved in a Ground Rules hearing. And um, it, defining it, uh, I, I don't see what one would gain by defining it. I think if one were to, and I answered this to someone else earlier, I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was who asked me about it, but that um, that the, the um, kind of issues that are raised at a grand rules hearing are listed in detail in the practice note. And as we evaluate the practice note, if we find that there are other issues that it would be useful to discuss, uh, we can add them in very quickly. And uh, if they were listed in the primary legislation, that wouldn't be possible. Permissible uh, is a matter for the court to determine. Um, and it would be very difficult to uh, come up with a comprehensive definition because so much will depend on the actual circumstances of the case. Because the first rule of permissibility is that the question must be relevant to the circumstances of the case. And so far as the form of questioning is concerned, the questions must be such that they are sufficiently geared towards the level of comprehension of the witness. So if you have a, a, a child witness, say you have a five-year-old child, the kind of questioning that might be permissible in those sense for a five-year-old would be quite different from what you might have for a 17-year-old or for what you might have for an adult vulnerable witness. So. My, my strong feeling really is that these are things that can be developed within the overall concept uh, without requiring them to be um, put in a straitjacket of a definition. Yeah, I think that's been a helpful discussion to tease out the issue. Yeah. It, it just say, if, if this process is to be focused on addressing the indiv individual needs of the witness, then you want to make sure you have that flexibility to, able, to be able to address those individual needs. It's, if it's going to be a victim-focused or witness-focused approach, setting out it has to cover certain things in legislation and perhaps leaving out others actually limits your ability to, to have that individual approach. That's, um, that's very helpful. There was just one other issue they raised from the policy memorandum, and that was the use of the generic term victim, and they suggested perhaps complainer would have been... Um, better. Yes, well, certainly um, from the court's point of view, that is uh, uh, the term that we would use. Mm -hmm. um, the, the um, yeah, definitely that is the case. We, the, the formulation that we would use. There are a number of cases about using particular terms and the appropriateness of a judge using a particular term, uh, and the, the word complainer would certainly be more of more assistance. That concludes our line of question, Lady Dorian. Can I thank you very much for giving evidence today and, and Tim Barraclough too. It's been exceedingly helpful for our scrutiny of the bill. We'll now suspend and have a, a five-minute comfort break. <laughs>
Agenda item three is an evidence session on the management of Offenders Scotland Bill. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk, and paper four, which is a private paper. And I welcome John Watt, Chair of the Parole Board for Scotland, Yvonne Gailey, uh, Chief Executive Risk Management Authority, Dr Joanna Brown, Consultant Forensic Psychiatrist, Royal College of Psychiatrists, Scotland, and James Maybe, Principal Officer, Criminal Justice, Interim Chief Social Work Officer, Highlands Council, representing Social Work Scotland. And again, can I thank the witnesses for their written evidence, um, as ever it's really, really helpful to the committee in advance of us hearing from you um, in person. We'll move straight to questions from members, starting with John. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning, panel. And yes, thank you indeed for your uh, contributions, uh, written contributions. I'd like to ask questions about the new arrangements, if I may, please. Um, and if you ask you to comment on the improved information sharing that we're advised about and uh, who takes the decision and the, the level at which the decision is taken. Could you could comment on that, please? If we don't have volunteer, we, we have conscripts. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Watt, will we try you? What stage of the process are we talking about here, please, Mr. Finney? We, we're talking about the point at which the Scottish Prison Service um, uh, assess someone's suitability for home detention. All right. I think I can sit back at that one then, because it hasn't come to the parole board yet at that stage. Anyone else like to start off with that, Mr. Maybe? Thank you, Convener. In respect of HTC, obviously criminal justice social work are involved in that assessment process uh, and we are notified or requested to provide a, a written assessment, um, which we do. Um, that assessment submitted to the Scottish Prison Service and they consider that and it's part of their decision-making process. Ultimately, it's obviously it's their, their decision as to whether to release somebody on HTC. Uh, and that's a changed arrangement, Mr Maybe, from the, what happened previously? No, that's, it's always been the case that Criminal Justice Social Work have provided an assessment report to Scottish Prison Service. All right, OK. Um, and so when the term improved information sharing, has there never been an issue with information sharing between Scottish Prison Service and Criminal Justice Social Work? Information exchange has generally been, been very good. Um, we worked to the current HTC guidance, which was refreshed a couple of years ago. Um, and I believe that's currently subject to further review. Um, there has been um, a joint SBS Police Scotland and Scottish Government working group looking at that. Um, Social Work Scotland is just in the process of formulating our response to, to the social work aspects of that report. Um, that's not yet been brought to the Social Work Scotland Standing Committee, uh, Justice Standing Committee. See, but Primarily here, because we were taking evidence, and of course there was a, a, a very a tragic case which focused a lot of minds. There was a lot of, um, so um, I think not unreasonably we anticipated that there may be further. Uh, perhaps you're saying it's a refresh of existing arrangements, but there was no difficulties at all previously with information sharing that you were aware of. Well, there's, there's always been a clear set of guidance for for HDC, um, and in terms of the criminal justice social work responsibilities. Um, you know, they're set out very clearly in terms of what our responsibilities are. Um, so, for example, in terms of the, the guidance that was introduced a couple of years ago, um, that set out much more clearly in terms of our responsibilities to conduct a home visit, for example, to ensure that it's not just a telephone conversation, for example, with, with the homeowner, there's actually a physical visit um, to, to ascertain the circumstances regarding the, the proposed property and residence of the prisoner. So, OK, um, it, it, it would... Uh, 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 well, let me take a different tack, then, if I may, please. Um, we're told that from the Scottish Prison Service evidence, and I welcome all your views on this, please, um, that there's now a presumption against home detention, uh, um, and that is uh, curfews, and that's led to a 75% reduction in their use. And my question would be, does that suggest or reasonable to suggest then that there's uh, risk aversion has crept in where it previously wasn't there and uh, trying to understand the wider implications for, for instance, prison capacity uh, and the very important issue of rehabilitation. Could the panel comment on that, please? Uh, 
I think, uh, with respect, Mr Finney, it's difficult to comment. Um, obviously, we don't have a representative from Scottish Prison Service here. Um, I can only speak from my own agency's perspective and that when we're requested to provide an assessment, then we'll carry out and, and provide that in, a, in, in accordance with the guidance. As to what triggers that request, that, that's entirely a matter for Scottish Prison Service. Um, we can only respond to that request and provide the assessment and ensure that there's sufficient detail uh, to enable the Scottish Prison Service to make a, a fuller, more rounded risk assessment in respect of whether somebody qualifies for, for release. OK, if, if there is a 75% reduction in our advice there is on, on the granting of these, is it too early to have seen any manifestation of that on the workload of criminal justice social work? I, I can't sit here and, and claim I could quote you figures with regard to HTC uh, requests. Um, it might suggest that Scottish Prison Service have taken a slightly different tack, um, possibly in light of, of media coverage and concerns about prisoners being released on HTC. Um, but I, I can't really say much more than that, I'm afraid. And Ms Gidley, do you have a, a view on this in, uh, as part of risk assessment? Thank you, thank you, uh, and thanks for inviting us to be here today. Um, I, I do have an interest in uh, the, this um, HDC from the perspective of risk assessment, and that's really the only uh, perspective that I can comment on it from, rather than from operational processes. Um, however, we have, we have recently been invited to join a group uh, run by the Scottish Government and Scottish Prison Service to review the guidance for HDC with a particular focus on the current risk assessment process. Um, I, th I think that has a bearing on, on the questions that you're asking, Mr Finney, about the, the reduction in numbers. And I think one of the points that were covered in the first meeting of this group, it was only met on one occasion last week, was that there is a need, if you're refining a risk assessment process, and I think there is an argument for doing that, then it's really essential to start from having a really clear understanding of the purpose of the intervention that you're assessing for. And I think that perhaps the introduction of the presumptions against recently have inadvertently or in purpose, it's not for me to say, really raised a question about the purpose of HDC. What is the intention? What, what, what is in, in place to achieve? because it's from that perspective that then we can work out the correct risk assessment process and also have a, a, a clear idea, or as clear as possible, of who is the right candidate for HDC. But if, if there's a reduction in 75%, we're told by the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison yes, Service, that either suggests that there's, um, there was a frailty in the previous system, there's a new robust regime in place, do you have a view? Was the, were the previous existing uh, arrangements satisfactory? Is it, or, that's a, a dramatic turnaround in figures, yes, I think I, I would acknowledge. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't really comment, comment on the operational <coughs> arrangements rather than the risk assessment process. I, I do but, see... But surely they're one and the same, if you, if you forgive me, um, I mean, because the, the whole basis of the Scottish Prison Service uh, and indeed the whole judicial process is, should be about risk assessment, the suitability of someone for this, the requirement for them to be um, put in custody in the first place? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think what we would need to do in order to answer your question in a robust way is take up the recommendation of the inspectorate in terms of research being needed into home detention curfew, both to, to understand what's happened in the past and to, to guide the way forward. Because I think I'm not aware of evidence that's currently available um, but that might be my lack of awareness, to tell us wh what we need to know about... Well, we understand, for example, that there's an 80 per cent... There has been an 80 per cent successful completion rate in HDC. But what would be interesting to know in order to answer your question, I think, would be what do we know about the circumstances and characteristics of the cases of the 80 per cent and the 20 per cent who didn't complete successfully, because I think it's from that way that we can we could understand what, what, what has been the reason for the, the, the dramatic reduction. Is, it a, it, has it, is that, in fact, the direction of travel that we wish to go on, or, 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 is, it, is, or is it not? Well, is it a reaction? Can, can I ask, were any of the panel members aware of the Scottish Prison Service change in the new presumption arrangements, and did any of you play any part, or your organisations play any part, in informing that changed arrangement? 
uh, certainly that my organisation's first involvement was when we were asked to take part in the, 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 the group that's recently been established. Okay, I'm concluded. It would be helpful um, if you explained risk assessment Scotland to know exactly you know, who, who you're pointed with, what you do, at what stage in any particular process you may have an input. Uh, that would be really helpful. From the risk management authorities' point yes. of view? Yes, indeed. So we, we've got a, a number of statutory functions which all have a bearing on effective risk assessment and management practice. Mm -hmm. Now, the ones that po is possibly most relevant to, the, to this discussion is our responsibility to set a standard, to set the standards for risk assessment against which practice is judged generally. And then we also have very specific responsibilities in relation to the order for lifelong restriction. But from the, the discussions that we're having today, it's our more general functions that I think are relevant, which are in terms of um, advising on policy and research, setting standards, delivering training, mm -hmm. publishing guidelines, right. and uh, all in relation to risk assessment and risk management. Okay. And I, I suppose the question is, did you have any concerns then prior to um, the new rules coming into, um, into being? Well, well, was there anything raised just generally that, or even specifically in, in the risk from a, a risk assessment point of view? Not, not specific to, to HDC. The, as, as I say, right. the, our, our first direct involvement has, has been w w in recent times. However, while I talk about us generally setting standards, we're also involved in different risk assessment processes at different points in time to give advice on developing practice mm -hmm. processes as they are currently to ones that, that would closer uh, aspire to the standard that we've set. So, Colleagues of mine have been involved with Scottish Prison Service of, in, in recent times, looking generally at the, the risk assessment of short-term prisoners. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think there's a, a, a very close overlap between the discussions on HDC and that piece of work. And I think that might be one the most direct route of, of, of influencing the risk assessment uh, of HDC. Right, that, that's, that's helpful to clarify. You've been looking at the short-term sentence risk assessment, not specifically AD, HDC, but clearly you think there is now um, a, 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 an argument for absolutely looking at HDC. I, I, well. What I would say is that, that we, that we promote that there's, there's, a, a, there's a basic approach to risk assessment that can be applied in any situation, in any group, with any group and in any context. And we've set the standard for that, that type of risk assessment. And we work steadily through different processes and, and agencies to, to integrate that. It's a well integrated in criminal justice social works um, processes and, and, and with a Police Scotland. Now, in, in certain areas of work with Scottish Prison Service, that's, um, that's, it's already well integrated. And the one that we currently are working on together is looking at short-term prisoners because it, it, it raises particular challenges in, in its own right. OK, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Uh, supplementaries, Liam Kerr and Daniel Johnson. Is that right? No? <laughs> uh, no, but, but since you're bringing me in, convener... Um, <laughs> Maybe the, 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 um, the, um, the questions have moved on from where you were going to come I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll happily put something to Yvonne Gailey, if, if I may, yeah. uh, which is simply around... Uh, when you were talking about risk assessment, uh, risk to whom and risk of what? Uh, and where I'm specifically going here is uh, Mr Finney's talking about 75% uh, reduction in use. Uh, and that clearly has a, a, a negative impact in terms of prison, uh, overcrowding and uh, opportunities for rehabilitation. One would have thought that the overriding consideration is risk to the public uh, from allowing people out on HDC. Is that in fact the case? That, that is an excellent question. It's a very, very fundamental question when we're talking about risk. And in any process, practice process, set of guidelines that are developed, it's absolutely essential to identify what we mean by the term risk. Mm. And um, it's, uh, there are often several different risks involved. And mm -hmm. generally speaking, certainly in, in, the, in the risk management authorities' work, it's, it's very specific, the legislation is very specific, that we are talking about the risk of serious harm to the public. Now, in, 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 most, pra in most areas of work, that that would be what, what, what people are, are, are that, has to, that is a primary consideration mm 
there are certain um, aspects of, of, of the criminal justice system, of criminal justice work, where when people are talking about risk, they're thinking about the likelihood of reoffending. And that, 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 that is also a valid concern at times. We, I, 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 we certainly consider that when we talk about risk, we ha have to be considering both a combination of the likelihood of something happening and the impact that it will have on whom and how serious that impact is estimated to be. That there, there are a number of dimensions to risk, but it's always essential to be identifying what, what it is that you're assessing and what it is that you're estimating or forecasting in terms of your risk assessment, that who, who, what, what group of people or what person is at risk from a particular person and what's the nature of that risk? Can I clarify? Because uh, Thanks for the answer. Um, I'm not sure I quite heard, though, uh, how, where in terms of priority, I would have thought the key priority is preventing harm to the public. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? And, and secondly, could you, you, you talked there about the prevention of serious harm. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm slightly concerned, you've, you've triggered something in my mind, and I can't just quite put my finger on it. The, the serious bit, is it the case then that a consideration of there is a possibility, dare I say probability of harm mm -hmm. to the public, if it is not serious harm, then the decision could be taken to allow someone to go out on HDC. That is, thank you for clarifying that. I wasn't, what I was wanting, unsure of there is if we were speaking generally or in relation to HDC. We have, we have, um, I, I'm wondering, are you referring to the three sort of guiding principles in terms of HDC? And when you, well, if I can, if, if you might, don't mind me asking for clarification, when you say that a uh, risk of harm to others or to the public is a priority, I'm wondering, is there an implication that as opposed to something else? I, I think that's where I'm not quite clear what you're asking me. I, I, I think in when we're talking about risk assessment, what will always be foremost in someone's mind is, a, is risk of harm to others, whether that, that, that's specific of the, the public at large. And is that harm clarified by a, or caveated by a category of seriousness? Or is it any harm to the public? If we're talking about HDC and my reading of the HDC guidance, that's, that, that's, that, that caveat is not, well, whether it's a caveat or whether it's a clarification, it, it is, is not there. And I, I've read through it several times and it appears to me that the, the risk that is being discussed is, is considered is risk of harm to the public. And that is the top priority, that is the top consideration. And that, that's where I'm, I'm, at the beginning of the HDC guidance, it refers to there being three objectives or three guiding principles or considerations that must be come into play. One's the protection of the public, mm -hmm. one's um, the prevention of reoffending, and the other's about reintegration. Now, I think in, in a situation where there was um, a choice to be made about one trumping the other, if that if the point, then risk of harm to others would, would, would win out there. However, in reality, what uh, uh, those working in the, 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 this context must do is balance all three, because reducing reoffending and promoting safe reintegration of prisoners into the community is one or two of the best ways of protecting the public. So I, so I think there's, there, there is, there, there, is a, there, there's, there is more than there's not either or in terms of those considerations. But if, a, if there was a situation where um, one had to, had to win, it, it, would, it would be in terms of pr protecting the public. And my reading of the HDC guidance suggests that that, 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 is, that that's the priority in there. I think the scope for clarification within the guidance material along the lines that you're talking to make it absolutely clear that that, that, that is risk of harm to others that, 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 is, that is the consider consideration. Thank you. I think we'd agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, uh, supplementary. Yes, I just really wanted to sort of follow on from some of the points raised by John Finney uh, around the role of uh, social work in, in terms of the assessment, the information sharing, and particularly the point where he left off regarding uh, assessment of uh, homes. Clearly, with the McClelland case, the, 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 where that 
uh, individual who murdered Craig McClellan actually resided as it was in question. So can I just ask, and two specific questions around that, um, uh, how, how is that information shared? Is that information also acted upon? And, and are the circumstances in which actually someone is not present at the, 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 the address that they have given? or that there are concerns raised about um, you know, anything connected with that in particular about the likelihood of reoffending, is that shared, is that acted upon? And then the other particular point is, is when people give addresses outside of Scotland, uh, because that is a, a, a concern that's been raised through uh, this case. What happens in those circumstances? How is that assessed? Um, the guidance is very clear in terms of the criminal justice social work role, and it states absolutely clearly that we must visit a, an address um, that's put forward for HDC. There are, there are two caveats to that. One is where the individual is the sole key holder of the address, i.e. it's their own property. Um, and the other one is in, in terms of uh, remoteness. Clearly, in, in parts of Scotland, there are significant geographical challenges in, in visiting addresses. Um, but the overriding um, focus is to visit the address, and that, that's clear. And the, the word used in the guidance is must. So if an assessment report is completed by criminal justice social worker and is returned to Scottish Prison Service, and, for example, the home hasn't been visited and it's not been made clear why, then SPS are perfectly in their rights to contact the criminal justice social work service and ask for an explanation for that, uh, and indeed seek... Um, further information and clarity around the address. Um, so I think that there is there is absolute clarity around that. Um, but you don't, in, by implication, you don't necessarily know how that information is being used. No, and I, and I think that's that's perhaps one of the issues, and it might be helpful in, in respect to Mr. Finney's questions to to just make reference to the report on the review of the arrangements for home detention and curfew within SBS, which was published in October 2018. Um, the number of recommendations that come out of this, this particular piece of work, uh, one of which is that, and I'm quoting from, from the document, the assessment process should therefore be reviewed to ensure that it can satisfy the assertion within the guidance that, quote, a robust assessment process has been developed. It must be recognised that the SBS is not currently funded or staffed to undertake a more detailed multidisciplinary mm. approach to HTC risk assessment. And as such, the financial and resource implications would need to be addressed and appropriate funding provided. Recommendation three states specific training and risk evaluation assessment must be provided to individuals or teams tasked with making the decision to release someone on HDC. I think one of the issues is when information from criminal justice social work goes back to SBS, it's their decision-making forum. We don't have any, any input into that final decision. That goes you know, enti entirely mm -hmm. internally within SBS. There are occasions where, certainly in my own local authority, um, we have given information to SBS um, and have taken issue with, with the SBS's decision because we believe that the information we're providing is of significant concern um, and clearly we, we feel that perhaps that HTC is not, not appropriate. I think from my reading of, of the recommendations here, there is, there is a, a move towards having a more multi-agency framework mm -hmm. in terms of the decision-making um, and ensuring that Scottish Prison Service staff are properly trained um, in, in the tenets of risk assessment. And referring back to, to Von Gailey's points, you know, we, we all work in Scotland to, to the frame, the framework of, for risk assessment and management and evaluation, which sets out the kind of the core tenets of how we should approach risk, risk assessment and, and risk management. And I think it's about just ensuring that that square is circled. So yes. I, I wouldn't want to sit here and be unnecessarily... Uh, or, or seem to be critical of SBS. I think it's just about understanding that process and how all the parts of the, the journey kind of link together. I, th I think that's very helpful, and, and I, I wouldn't want you to ask you on the spot to give a characterisation of some of those situations, but if it was possible for you just to provide some examples, obviously bearing in mind that there'll be confidential elements to it, where, where you think that information hasn't necessarily been acted on, that, that would be quite useful I'd, I'd, for, for the committee's deliberation. Um, can I just touch? Um, it's a supplementary, if you don't mind, um, Daniel, and it's an area that Jenny had already <laughs> indicated uh, uh, an interest in pursuing. If your question hasn't been answered at the end of our questioning, I'll bring you back in, Jenny. 
I'd like to, James, maybe drill down into some of the, the written evidence that we uh, received ahead of today's meeting. So I know from your written evidence that Social Work Scotland would have reservations regarding the use of EM as an alternative to lower tariff disposals. And then you go on to say there is a risk that a two-tier system would be created in which electronic monitoring is used disproportionately with those on low incomes. I wonder if you could say a bit more as to why you, you think that might be the case. I think Social Work Scotland are not convinced of the argument that EM should be used for, you know, for, for things like find default, for example. And I think our concern is that, that there is a risk that it becomes a default option, mm -hmm. um, that because you can't afford to pay, you get EM. And I think there are lots of kind of eth ethical issues around EM and proportionality. Um, it is a restriction of somebody's liberty in a way that finding someone isn't. Um, and I think these things have to be taken into consideration in considering whether or not um, EM is is a proportionate disposal or sentence for, for people of much lower risk. Mm -hmm. and, and secondly, I'd like to follow up with regard to monitoring um, any additional conditions which, which might be attached other than the curfew. Um, so I note in your submission you, you talk about uh, guidance for GPS monitoring should involve clearly defined boundaries for buffer and exclusion zones. It is imperative that boundaries are unambiguous and clearly outlined for those subject to restriction. And you then go on to talk about the implications this might have in terms of uh, resource and staffing. Um, <coughs> Are there any other issues in terms of rurality around about GPS? I think that's alluded to as well in the submission. And training, is that something that's been considered by Social Work Scotland? In respect to GPS, I, mean, I think there are issues with regard to the remoteness and, and whether or not um, the equipment will, will function yeah. um, you know, consistently um, to, to enable it to, to do its job. Um, I think technology is developing all the time and so on and so forth, but I'm not sure we're we can be absolute, absolutely confident that mm -hmm. that's not going to create a problem. I think in terms of GPS and, and how that is actually going to be used uh, in terms of resources, I mean, that's an interesting question because to a certain extent we don't know from yeah. a Scottish perspective. We, we can look and see what's happening internationally. Mm -hmm. And it depends to what, to, in terms of how GPS is used. Are we talking about active GPS monitoring, or we're we talking about passive GPS monitoring, for example. If it's active and we're monitoring in, in, in real live time, 24-7, um, the movements of an offender, clearly the, the, there is an issue there in terms of resource as yeah. to who does that, um, how's information shared. Um, and I think you know we can certainly learn from, from colleagues in other, other jurisdictions um, internationally, but I think it would be, be hard to say that there wouldn't be any additional cost, because I think there probably would be. Passive GPS clearly is a, is a slightly different um, situation where you you may review, say, over the course of a day, someone's movements and see if they possibly have breached their, you know, the exclusion zones, yeah. um, and then you decide what action to take. Um, but if you're talking about an active system where as soon as somebody se steps a foot over the exclusion line, then clearly resources have to have to kick in very quickly. Mm -hmm. And you have to assume that somebody has breached that with, with, an, with intention. Yeah. Um, and, and everything has to follow from that. And that might be that there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for that, for that breach. Um, but until you know that, I think you have to assume that somebody is potentially at risk. Um, otherwise, obviously, there wouldn't be an exclusion zone set up. Yeah. Um, so I think there clearly would be, I think, resource implications to, to develop, not just for criminal justice social work, I think mm -hmm. for for other agencies, in terms of Police Scotland, for example, um, for, the, for the court service, in terms of how that's actually then dealt with. Okay. Thank you. OK, uh, we're still in release of HDC. A um, follow-up from Daniel. Yes. And uh, then, Liam, a brief question. We'll be moving on to release on parole, and I'm conscious that, Dr Brown, you haven't come in yet, or Mr Watt, but you will be in this session. Next session. <laughs> So I, I just really want to follow up a question directly in, in, in terms of what Mr. Maybe said to me regarding developing that multi-agency resp uh, response, and indeed more broadly what the, the, the uh, uh, Miss Gailey's uh, body is responsible for, and, and considering directly both the, the details that, that Mr. Maybe uh, raised there that were in the, the two reports from HMICS and HMIPS, but also more broadly bearing in mind the fact that, that the uh, inspectorate of prisons said that, that the, the, the processes that were in place would not be what you describe as robust. I was just wondering, uh, Ms. Gilly, what, what your reflections are in terms of the contents of those reports and, and what you think the key issues that need to be developed, bearing in mind that you have a direct kind of uh, 
a perspective around multi-agency working and development of risk management standards and kind of essentially wh wh what's the gap that you think has been identified by those two reports? Um, I, I find myself in, in um, almost entire agreement with the recommendations in the Prisons Inspectorate report in terms of risk assessment perhaps coming at them from a slightly different angle, but, but, but not, not too differently. I think is essentially what we have with the risk assessment process at the, at, at currently, uh, and I have shared this view with, with my colleagues uh, last week, is that um, we have part of a risk assessment practice in, in, in place. So it's essentially we, we promote that all risk assessments should have three core steps in it. One is identifying the relevant information, one that's analysing the meaning or the relevance of that information, and then evaluating all of that to inform the decision that you're, you're, you're being charged to make. Now, what I find with the risk assessment process currently is that it sets out um, a, a range of pieces of information that the, that the person doing the assessment is required to identify. And in that way, it, 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 the, the information that they're required to identify is very rational and, it, and, and it's evidence-based. They're, they're looking at the kind of behaviours that have happened in the past and the kind of behaviours that can be looked at currently that might suggest whether somebody's likely to comply or less likely to comply. However, what it doesn't do then is go to the next st stage and giving the person doing the assessment guidance about what to make of that information. So essentially at the moment is you know, looking at, you know, you know, what, what are the adverse behaviours in prison is, is what one of the questions are. Have there been adverse behaviours in prison? And the, 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 the assessor would consider whether there have or have not been. But that then it falls to the person doing the assessment to make meaning of that and then to decide what that meaning means in terms of the decision or the recommendation about HDC. So I see in these two areas that there, there, there is the need for further, further guidance for the practitioner who, of, of whatever, but it is generally prison officers who are, are undertaking, middle management prison officers who are undertaking those uh, HDC um, assessments before they go to the governor for sign off. And I think that, that, that we can set, I think I can see how it's perfectly achievable for us to work with Scottish Government and, and Scottish Prison Service to refine that process just, 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 just to, make, to make it that bit more robust by including that additional guidance and, and also as the inspector has recommended there would need to be some element of training or you know, determining what element of training is required to support that. And I would also support the recommendation about the need for some analysis and research about the use of HDC in the past and currently. So, so just briefly, and, and, and following directly on from that, uh, the, when we had SPS uh, before us uh, recently, they said uh, that they were essentially upholding the, the, the regulations such as they were up until the point that they changed. Do you think on the basis of the report that we have from HMIPS that's correct? The change in the arrangements, uh, mean, do you mean the presumptions against being introduced? They, they just essentially said that, 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 that they were uh, complying in full with the regulations such as they were, that there were no deficiencies I I exposed in terms of them following that, that regulation as set out. Would, would you agree with that? I understand that. I, 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 no, understanding that I don't have, have access no, to any of the details of the case, I understand that the, 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 the SPS and yeah. indeed the inspectors found that the process was followed correctly. That's my understanding, but I can't know any more than that. Uh, no, yep. thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Maybe you wanted to, to come in? Just briefly, convener, it might be helpful just to give a bit of context around risk assessment. You know, for example, for a criminal justice social worker who's trained to use the level of service and case management inventory risk and needs assessment tool, that requires a five-day training course um, with pre-course and post-course uh, evaluation as well in order to actually pass and be accredited to use that tool. Now, and again, this is not a criticism of it, SPS and the HTC process. Um, if we're talking about short-term prisoners um, who, are, who are receiving prison sentences of less than four years, um, there may not be a criminal justice social report prepared at the court stage. Um, they may go straight to prison for very short periods. Um, there won't necessarily be 
a formal risk assessment that had been previously carried out. Um, so I think it's reasonable to ask the question on, on what basis then is all that information being pulled together in a systematic and structured way that, that involves both pulling together information, assessing that, analysing it and evaluating it. For long-term prisoners, for the four years and, and over, um, there will be formal risk assessments that SBS can, can use as a basis for developing their judgment around HDC. I would stress it's not being criti you know, it's not critical of SBS. I think it's just a, and I don't doubt that the response you got, you know, from from SBS is absolutely correct in terms of that they are following the current process for HDC. But I think we wouldn't have these recommendations if there weren't some, some gaps that, that we need to look at in order to improve and tighten up the system to ensure that we have the best possible decision making around HTC. There are a number of reasons why HTC is a good thing. It tests out prisoners um, you know, coming to the end of their sentence, helps them to establish and reconnect with, with the communities and with families and friends and start looking for work. All sorts of very good reasons for it. It's just about ensuring public protection, community safety, and having an absolute robust system in place to do that. Best system. Um, Liam, very briefly on this. Very briefly, convener. Thank you. Uh, currently, where a, um, a person breaches an HDC, uh, they don't commit an offence. Uh, the HMICS report from October says that there should be such an offence. Does the panel have a view on that? Does the panel agree? Is it directed to anyone in particular, Liam? Uh, not really, but perhaps James may be. Do you think a, a, a breach uh, of HDC should be an offence, given what you've just said in answer to Daniel Johnson's question? I can give you a personal response, not okay. a Social Work Scotland response. Mm -hmm. um, I think there would be merit in considering that. I think there's a, there's a kind of a cause and effect, and there's an issue of personal responsibility um, in adhering to, to that. Um, Certainly, if you, if you compare it to other breaches of community payback orders or, or prison licences, clearly there are consequences in terms of an individual being held to account for that breach. Um, it doesn't necessarily follow that there's a sanction imposed, say, for a, for a CPO, um, but somebody has to go back, they have to state their case um, and be held responsible for, you know, for the fact that they haven't complied with, with, their, with, with the licence or, or, the, or the conditions of the order. So I, th I think it, it, it's right... To, to, to consider that, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue that it would necessarily follow that there would be a sanction in every case, but I think there has to be consideration to that. I understand. And on that point then, uh, so th this committee heard uh, in a, at a previous session that currently a police, if, if there's a police officer at, at three in the morning and he suspects that a person has breached their HDC conditions, there is no power of arrest of that individual. Uh, the police view that was given to this committee was along the lines that there should be a power to arrest simply for suspicion of breach of an HDC. Uh, does any of the panel disagree with that view? Uh, if I may, mm -hmm. right, going back to my previous existence as uh, a procurator fiscal, if um, a policeman suspects that there has been or is likely to be a breach of a bail order, they have power to arrest without warrant. And you can see parallels between a prisoner being on trust on a bail order, an accused, sorry, and a prisoner being on trust in relation to a licence condition. Uh, and, and I would tend to agree with, with what um, the police service representative, I've forgotten who it was now, said that without some kind of provision, they feel powerless. Now, there are arguments about what they can and cannot do in certain circumstances without a warrant. Search without a warrant implies um, the, the power to break open lock fast places, for example, but in the 21st century there appears to be a reticence to do that. Uh, and I, I can well see why they would say give us a statutory power uh, and with a bit of luck they'd be able to use it and quickly. Mm. Thank you, that's helpful. You. We're moving on to parole, Rona. Thank you, yes. Um, on parole, I think it was, it was, it's now accepted that there were weaknesses in relation to HDC and the figures that John Finney quoted about a 75% reduction kind of speak for themselves. Can I ask you if you think there's lessons to be learned in terms of um, parole and in terms of risk assessment and, you know, returning to custody? What lessons can be learned from, from the previous experience? Uh, of, of the failure of HDC? 
Yes, just in, the, in light of tragic events and, and, and recent uh, it, It's changes. a very difficult question to answer. Any decision based on risk really uh, requires three considerations as far as we are concerned. There's the interest of the prisoner, the interests of third parties, victims usually, uh, and the, the public interest, community safety interest. If one of those takes a priority, it will be community safety, but it's a balancing exercise. It's almost impossible to answer that question without seeing a case, because each decision has to be case specific. So, for example, you could have a prisoner who's a relatively high risk, and you would have to have a very tough management programme to manage that risk in the community before you're satisfied you could make a decision to release. On the other hand, you might have a prisoner who's a low risk of reoffending, but if he did reoffend, it would be catastrophically serious. Uh, and you probably couldn't have a management plan in place to deal with that. You could have management plans that involve all sorts of satellite um, surveillance, um, GPS and whatnot, but sometimes you get to the point where if you need all that, the prisoner's probably too dangerous to release anyway. So it's a question you can't answer in advance, I think. Uh, I know that the European Court of Human Rights, for example, is, is very, very wary of broad statements like, we will not do this in relation to a particular process which may breach someone's convention rights. Uh, so, for example, if you say we're not going to release anybody who's been accused of violence or sexual offending, that would be struck down immediately. And that's why you really can't answer that question in advance. If you showed me a case, I could talk you through and explain the risk assessment and why it's relevant in that particular case I, I to that person. I understand what you're saying, but I'm talking about um, have you re-evaluated in light of recent events, tragic events, and two reports which have recommended quite sweeping changes. Have you re-evaluated how you deal with parole cases? No. Okay. Can I ask um, Dr Brown um, what your thoughts are on um, whether a psychiatrist should still be involved and, and you know, what the, the part of the bill that deals with that? Can you maybe expand a bit on that? We understand um, from our reading of it that um, psychiatrists would be precluded from being on uh, mm -hmm. the pro panel, but we do think that the presence of a psychiatrist is um, is of benefit to the panel and should remain. Um, and I think our written evidence um, outlines uh, the reasons for that and the expertise that um, a psychiatrist would bring to that. Um, Part of that, again, is um, in line with, with what we've heard in terms of our involvement in risk assessment. But part of it is our experience in treating mental illnesses um, and in the management of um, individuals, both within uh, a prison setting and uh, within the community setting, and our understanding of that. Mr Watt, do you have a thoughts on that? Um, I think I was asked a question like that last time I was here, and I'm pretty certain that that was shortly after a recruitment process. We would we'd been recruiting legal, psychiatric, and general members, and we had two applicants um, from psychiatrists, one of whom we appointed. So there doesn't appear to be an appetite out there. Uh, not only that, but the board will appoint members to, to, to um, hearings in accordance with their availability. So even if we had psychiatrists, they wouldn't necessarily be available for the cases we need them for. We try to use them, the psychiatrists we do have, for those difficult and awkward cases, usually at the state hospital. Um, but it would be very, very difficult to be able to recruit the number of psychiatrists who would be needed to sit on all the cases they might be useful on. Uh, and that's just a fact of life. We do have a lot of health service um, psychiatric service uh, members, a lot from the nursing background, senior nurses, who have a, a firm understanding of the process. Um, beyond that, it's very difficult to say how you would be able to get the number of psychiatrists and you'd get them on the cases you need them on, unless you were to have some kind of dramatic change where you could appoint on an ad hoc basis. Um, I think um, within uh, psychiatry generally we're aware of uh, recruitment issues at, at a variety of different levels. Um, with regards to this, yes, we know that there have been difficulties um, and those difficulties remain. That 
shouldn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't be part of that process. Mm -hmm. My final point on this, if I may, mm -hmm. is that if, if the board considers that it needs the assistance of a psychiatrist, it can instruct that a psychiatrist carry out some work with the prisoner um, and attend a hearing as a witness to assist the board, to assist the tribunal in working its way through how to arrive at a conclusion. Uh, and the board makes its decision on the evidence before it. So in some ways, having the professional evidence of a psychiatrist who has seen the prisoner for a particular purpose is perhaps as valuable as having a psychiatrist on the panel. So it's not as though in certain cases we do not have the benefit of psychiatric evidence, far from it. If we need it, we'll go out and get it. Okay. So you, you do have psychiatric evidence for, for certain cases? It's very unusual, but we do. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to the Orchard Clinic tomorrow, and I fully expect to have two psychiatrists there to explain okay. the position to and us. And you take that into account? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Can I ask Ms Gailey what you think about the psychiatrist angle? Is that something necessary for risk assessment? I had, uh, at, at the point of the, the consultation uh, um, on, on the changes to parole board membership, um, I, my view was that the previous arrangements that required a number of people from different backgrounds was quite helpful to maintain a, a, a balance of views and expertise on the board. Um, but um, I, I, the, 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 my view in, uh, is, is somewhat distant on that, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that others uh, here know much more about it than I do. Okay, thank you. If, if I could just return to this point, if I understand you right, <clears throat> Mr. Watt, then you'd be saying if we think we need a psychiatrist, then we can always, um, the actual expertise that they can give, the forensic things, we can call it in. That's relying on you knowing and recognising that you do. If there's a statutory obligation that they are part of the team, the expertise is there from day one, as soon as that case well, is, is it, if it, you would let me finish. Yes, sorry. Uh, uh, and I think if we're looking at risk assessment and we're playing at, at very high and emotive issues here, then I, for one, uh, would, would not want to leave it to chance, which it appears to me not having that statutory obligation would effectively be doing. It's not leaving it to chance. All members have a very broad experience of the criminal justice system. I understand that. You've made that point. Now, two and a half thousand cases a year and we have one psychiatrist. It's hard to see how you could have a system like the one you've described where a psychiatrist looks at all the cases just to make sure that we don't miss the one that needs a psychiatrist. Uh, I spent a lifetime in the prosecution service identifying cases where there were peculiar issues about it and on a precautionary basis you would seek a report from a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, we have enough members who, if there was doubt about a case, we could approach them. But each case is informed by a dossier and unless there's something in that dossier which clearly indicates there's the potential history, for example, of a psychiatric <laughs> illness or something very peculiar about the case. Uh, you would expect the dossier to throw up a clue for you. Yeah. Uh, and that's where we look. I'm not conscious there's been an issue, not in my time on the board anyway, where we've misinterpreted a case and where we had a prisoner who did require some kind of psychiatric input and we missed it. Uh, usually, these cases are transfers from prison to secure or, or middle secure psychiatric hospitals where a psychiatrist has been involved in prison. We deal with long-term prisoners four years or more, uh, and there's usually an opportunity in prison for that kind of problem to be identified. It may not be resolved, but it will almost always be identified. I think we're still going on back to my initial point that it's reliant on the board thinking there is an issue there, and you think you've got enough uh, general expertise with people who have, may have some kind of psychiatric ba um, background. So perhaps I could bring in you, Dr Brown, because it seems to me there's a very specialised knowledge that you have that would be useful um, to have on a statutory basis. Um, generally and certainly to pick up the expertise where it's required. Yes, and that's the, the position that the, the Royal College in Scotland holds. I think, um, and the panel um, know that risk assessment is a very broad area. Psychiatry are part of that. Many of our multidisciplinary colleagues are part of that and our multi-agency colleagues are part of that. 
I think the specific knowledge and expertise that we bring is broader than that. Um, I know that Mr Watt has, has mentioned already the role of, um, of other health experts, including psychiatric nurses, um, thinking about clinical psychologists as well. What um, psychiatry are bringing is that knowledge of, um, of treatment of illness of what we can um, expect people to, uh, to agree to, um, to be involved with in terms of their care, and also the involvement, should there require to be in uh, looking forward to time in the community, how to integrate within community mental health teams, whether they should be forensic-led mental health teams or not. Um, the involvement of um, the Mental Health Act, should that be required? There are and a variety of levels of expertise which we have outlined that we think should remain part of, of, of the parole board in a statutory way. Okay. I, I certainly find your um, submission compelling. Okay. Supplementary. Supplementary, Supplementary, Lorna. Um, I wonder if I could just ask Ms Scaly, um, I'm struggling a wee bit to understand when you're doing risk assessment, does someone's mental health not come into that? Yeah. You know, I mean, is that part of how you decide what the risk will be if there's a mental health issue? If, if you don't know that, how can you do proper risk assessment? Mental health would certainly be a factor that would have to be considered when, when, when someone was undertaking a risk assessment. And depending on the, um, the degree to which it was suspected that there were, there was, that there were signs of, of mental health issues would, would, would very much determine the kind of professional who had to be involved in, in, the, in the assessment. Do you, judges, you think that there is a mental health issue? Do you know what I mean? How do you, do you just, do you do then, you call in professional services because you think there might be, or, you know, how does that work? Well, if, if I might draw uh, on, on the social work uh, experience, if we were thinking of, of, a, of a criminal justice social worker who was interviewing somebody to undertake an assessment and felt that there were aspects of that person's presentation that suggested there might be mental health issues, it would be incumbent upon them to approach a mental health professional. Sorry, criminal justice social work would do that. Yeah, or, or, or to say to the person that they were providing the report from, I, I have concerns about certain issues, but it's not, you know, I, I, I do, do not have the competencies to assess them. Mm -hmm. And either we have to live with that being unassessed or it has to be referred to the, 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 the correct uh, type of mental health professional. Um, if you forgive me, it sounds quite sort of arbitrary, like, you know, it might happen, it might not. Is it not quite essential to know um, whether or not someone has a mental health issue? It, 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 uh, yes, it certainly is, but th th that, does not, that, that, that doesn't mean that the resource to address that is, is, is always there. But what, 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 what is, is, is central is that somebody does not proceed to attempt to assess something that they don't have the experience and the expertise to assess. May I come back on that? Thank you. Um, yes. A, a very me. short point. If I'm following this discussion correctly, the, the argument is that it's not for members of the board or for social workers to identify whether an individual is suffering from a mental illness or maybe that it should be a psychiatrist who does that. Do I follow that correctly? I'm you, putting it to you. Do you think right, that well, should happen? I, I think I've said already that experienced and seasoned professionals ought to be able to spot an issue and then follow <laughs> it up. But if you're not with me on that, the only solution I can see is that every prisoner has a psychiatric assessment and that goes in the dossier before it comes to the board. If I could follow that up. Dr Brown, yeah. Um, I think with everybody, we're all at risk of, of experiencing mental illness. It's a one in four risk, and that applies within the prison setting as well. So there may or may not have been mental health difficulties identified prior to someone coming into the prison. Prison is not an easy experience. Um, many people develop different symptoms during their time in prison. So it might not be that these are things that have been historical concerns. These might be more recent concerns. Within Scotland, we're very fortunate. There are mental health teams within the prisons. For the most part, people who experience mental illness are identified readily by the experienced staff within the prison service and then directed to those mental health teams. So there should be 
access to um, professionals, not just psychiatrists, but trained mental health nurses as well. So that information could be made available if it's required. Having said that, that information might not be part of that original dossier. So having access to a psychiatrist on the parole board would be of benefit in following that up and having access to that information in a way that could inform. Thank you. That's Thank you. exceedingly helpful. <coughs> Quilton. Um, good morning or oh, good afternoon, panel. My question is going to be directed at, at, at James Maybe, and I wonder, uh, Mr. Maybe, if you could um, give an outline of the role of social work in forming and informing decisions about releasing parole, and perhaps taking into account the earlier line of questioning there, speak about um, how mental health would be assessed and perhaps the role of mental health officers in that. Thank you. In, in respect to parole, there's a very clear process, um, and there's a, there's a community-based element of that, and there's a prison-based element of that. Um, every prison will have a, a prison-based social work unit, um, and the prison-based social work unit will, will produce a, a parole report um, that goes into the dossier that will be considered um, by the parole board, um, and the community also provide a report that, that's separate. Um, <clears throat> there has currently um, just finished an evaluation of a process that I always have to look at my notes for this called Through Care Assessment for Release on Licence, or TAL for short, which is a, a, a pilot that's been running looking at um, streamlining that process and bringing together the prison and the community based parole reports into one assessment. Um, there's a lot of obviously ob obvious good, good reasons for that, in terms of rather than having two separate assessments, you have one assessment that brings together uh, the best of both worlds. Sometimes um, prison-based social work have a slightly different view about risk and risk management than the community, um, and that simply, I think, reflects the different perspectives that people are bringing to the task. Um, we do have interim guidance that's been issued and signed off by Chief Social Work Officers and through Social Work Scotland in respect of how the current arrangement, sh arrangement should work if there's a difference of opinion. Um, the default position in the very, very small number of cases where that does happen is that the community get the final say, in essence, because it's the community that will actually be managing the risk as and when that individual gets back into the community. So there's a very clear process um, currently um, in terms of how we um, submit and engage with the, the parole process. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a good outline um, answer, but the previous question was around mental health, and I think there's a concern uh, from colleagues around the table that perhaps mental health issues aren't being considered in the risk assessment process. Is there anything that you can say from the social work risk assessments and the social work risk assessments tools that you uh, identified earlier about how mental health is specifically addressed in that risk assessment and how um, other agencies and mental health officers, for example, would be brought into that process? Yes, absolutely. Mental health is something that would be considered um, in any social work assessment, um, right from the original criminal justice social work report that goes before the court. Now, it might be that a social worker is a mental health officer and has that qualification and therefore has that degree of uh, additional degree of knowledge and, and expertise than, than a normal social worker who doesn't. Um, but I think where a social worker has concerns around someone's mental health, um, whatever level that might be, um, they would certainly seek to refer that individual to specialist mental health services to get that, that assessment. For example, even at the court report stage, it's not beyond the possibility that a social worker would suggest to the court that they need to get a further psychiatric report or a further psychological assessment in order to inform the sentencing decision. Um, so it's something that social work is very alive to, and that process would continue through someone's journey through the prison estate. Um, if it's somebody who's being considered for parole, the prison-based social worker and indeed the community social worker who are involved in the integrated case management of that, that individual will always be considering mental health because we know it's, as Dr Brown has said, it, there's such a high prevalence of mental health issues. And as I say, they're not, they're not experts, they're not psychiatrists, they're not forensic psychologists, but they would always seek to refer to seek you know, further assessment and information to inform their decision making and then to include that information in the report. I would, I would be very surprised if, if a prisoner got to a parole board um, hearing and if that individual had some form of mental health problem that that wasn't flagged up in, in some shape or form. <laughs> 
Well, would that surprise come about because the, um, the, the risk assessment would ask um, or identify is probably a better word if there had been any history of diagnosis of mental illness or current? Yes, and the social worker would always look for any previous involvement um, in terms of mental health and would seek to get pull information together because that's such a critical part of an overall assessment. Okay. I, I think that's helpful in that line of question. And just um, uh, in terms of the social work role in monitoring parole conditions moving on, can you expand a wee bit on that and um, say where well, there's maybe um, areas of, of difficulty and where there's good practice? In terms of when uh, somebody's actually in the community? Yeah. I mean, certainly if somebody's subject to a statutory prison licence, they will be um, monitored and supervised in accordance with the national outcomes and standards and the guidelines associated with that. Um, I think it's fair to say that the current through care <coughs> guidance for criminal justice social work is very out of date. Um, it's, I think it was written either in the late 1990s or 2000s, and there have clearly been significant developments since um, in how we do business. Um, and I think it's gen generally accepted that uh, we, we need to have a more up-to-date through care set of guidance to follow. Um, but the high-level national outcomes and standards set very clear guidelines in terms of how often an individual should be seen uh, related to their risk. Um, and certainly social work, you know, it's our task to ensure that prisoners are seen in accordance with those guidelines and, and monitored very strictly. Yeah. I'm happy with that, Camilla. Thank you. That concludes our line of questions. Can I thank all the witnesses for attending and presenting your evidence to the committee in person today? We suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave. The next agenda item is consideration of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act in relation to a UK statutory instrument. The law applicable to contractual obligations and non-contractual obligations amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018. I refer members to Paper 5, which is a note by the Clerk, and invite any comments from members. John? Very much, convener. Convener, um, it's that note I want to refer to in particular um, the question of timescales and the, the phrase drafting issues emerge late. Um, I, I don't have any particular issues with this, this, this proposal, but it, clearly we would want to try and understand the basis of some of the, 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 the restricted period we may have to consider what are very important issues, and uh, I just would like that put on the record. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask um, Stephen to clarify what the issues are um, with. Yeah, I'm very happy if uh, the member wants me to go back to the Scottish Government for a bit more information on what those drafting issues were when they arose in the process, if I provide a bit more explanation to the committee. I think that would be helpful. I'm grateful to the clerk. Thank you, Kavina. Okay. Are there any more comments? That being the case, then, um, is the committee content to recommend that the Scottish Parliament gives its consent to the UK Parliament to pass this statutory, statutory instrument? Content? Yes. Thank you. And is the committee content um, that if the, clerk, um, <coughs> the clerks will produce a short report and um, are you content to delegate authority to me uh, to publish this report? Yes. You are. Thank you. Agenda item five is consideration of an update from the Scottish Government to, in relation to the proposed integration of the British Transport Police into Police Scotland. I refer members to paper six, which is a private paper. Do members have any comments? Mm -hmm. okay. in. Have I misunderstood something? No, I think we were just um, getting a, a verbal, uh, a written 
um, all right. update from. So, so we're, okay, so we're noting so the we're letter and the, the cover. Yeah. Thing. All right. Thank you. You can take with that. Yeah, okay. Um, is there any clarification? Um, the, there was wasn't immediately clear exactly if there was a specific um, option to be looked at, nor the timetable for you know um, implementing what they are now suggesting. Um, I think there is still um, the objective of full integration at some point. So perhaps if we got some clarification on exactly where we are now and where um, the government sees us going, perhaps ask other um, stakeholders on to comment on where we are now, like BTP, B, um, the BTPA and the BTP Federation. Um, perhaps if, if they can think and, and get an idea of what they expect in time scales, would maybe put some meat in the bones. Daniel and then Lee. First of all, I'd just very much like to um, echo the, the point you've just made, Kamina, about time scales. I think the absence of time scales, uh, I mean, I, I think having some clarity on that. The other point that obviously has been concerned up to the now has, has been um, the, the cost of the, the programme so far. Maybe requesting an update on, on that might be useful. Liam? Yeah, I, I, I'll put this out there because it was the question I was going to put to the Cabinet Secretary. I think Daniel makes exactly the right points there. Um, with, with one other part to it, which is that what I'm hearing from the Cabinet Secretary, it's a, a genuine thing I don't understand. I'm hearing from the Cabinet Secretary that, look, if, if there's a satisfactory arrangement come to in the medium term, uh, then perhaps full integration might not be necessary. He is absolutely clear, and rightly so, that uh, he's concerned about the, uh, the uncertainty for the officers and the long-term impact of that. And yet, yeah. in the letter, it still says, look, regardless of what happens in the medium term, in the long term, we are still going to go for merger. And I genuinely don't understand that. Um, because the Cabinet Secretary is a smart guy, you know, he, he, he will get this like anyone else, yet seems to say it doesn't matter if we're successful in the medium term, we're still going to do it. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that's where the time skills are, are pretty mm -hmm. crucial. Rona and then John. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think it's just important to say that I think the Cabinet Secretary has realised, you know, that there are issues around this among stakeholders, and by doing this, he's... Um, He's asking them to work together to come up with an interim an interim solution, but the the, the ultimate objective is still full integration. But um, I think this is him taking steps just to clarify um, where we are with it at the moment. And I think it's a very very practical, very sensible um, move. And John. Yeah, no, I, I think there's been many valid points made. Um, I, I'm quite frustrated about the, the process, I think, for largely different reasons to, to other people. But one thing that I would hope that we could be united on, uh, convener, is the fact that we have a, a police service operating in Scotland with all the powers of a police service, the powers of stop and search, powers of arrest, the powers of surveillance, the powers to uh, execute warrants, um, and no scrutiny by this parliament over that. And I, I think that's a major deficiency we need to look at. But it would be helpful to get updates. Um, I, I think that would be very helpful. Okay, if the committee's agreed, then we'll write um, to these stakeholders and to the, the um, government just to seek um, the information on the points that have been raised. Are all agreed? Right, thank you for that. Um, item six, agenda item six, is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 6 December 2018. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions, and I refer members to paper seven, which is a note by the clerk, and invite John Finney to provide that feedback. Th thank you, convener. As you say, the, the, the subcommittee met on the 6th of December, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, at which time we heard from Police Scotland and the Scottish Refugee Council. Uh, that was in our evidence session on Police Scotland's role in the immigration process. Um, and part of that was considering Police Scotland's role in assisting the Home Office compliant and enforcement teams in the enforced removal of people from residential properties in Scotland. And we also considered the wider implications of how that impacted on relationships with communities. Um, we heard that there's much that um, Police Scotland can do to improve uh, its role in assisting the Home Office compliance and enforcement teams. It, not critical of Police Scotland, Police Scotland and particularly uh, one area was the risk assessments carried out by the Home Office prior to a request to Police Scotland um, to be present when persons are arrested and detained. 
The Scottish Refugee Council told the subcommittee that the Home Office is not good at accessing vulnerability and gave specific <coughs> examples of individuals who had been targeted for arrest, who had low um, uh, mental capacity and uh, were, in fact, blissfully unaware of what was going on. And it was suggested that Police Scotland's involvement in this process was a real opportunity and soon that these vulnerable people uh, in Scotland are not detained. I think it's important to say that Police Scotland um, were very clear that they apply the same strict criteria about detaining someone or re retaining someone in custody. Um, um, and that's regardless of uh, the circumstances in which someone's arrested. Um, Police Scotland were not able to confirm what the Home Office risk assessment entailed and whether it included assessment of the vulnerability or the impact of, on, for instance, children if their parents are to be detained. And the, the subcommittee has written to the Home Office to ask for details of its risk uh, and vulnerability assessment. I think it's fair to say, too, that we had sought evidence from the Home Office in advance of the meeting, and it was disappointing that uh, that wasn't forthcoming. Um, uh, we also uh, heard that Police Scotland does not have a statutory duty to work with or inform third sector organisations or other relevant stakeholders that it is to detain an individual and they can't do that even in a confidential way. And the subcommittee is checking whether the Home Office provides information to relevant agencies prior to a removal request involving third sector agencies would enable health, social work and third sector organisations the opportunity to provide vital support services to those who are detained. Um, finally, there, there's a lack of statistical data in the public domain about immigration detentions in Scotland and the subcommittee has requested statistical data from Police Scotland. Um, and we also advised the Human Rights and Equalities Committee of our work, given the, the, the overlap there. And, uh, the subcommittee also agreed its forward work programme is to schedule an evidence session with the Chief Constable in January. Indeed, our next meeting will be on the 17th of January. Okay. Thank you very much, John, for that comprehensive report. Member, has have any comments or questions? That being the case, then we now move into private session. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on the 8th of January 2019. Can I wish everyone... Merry Christmas, a relaxing um, time hopefully over New Year and um, very best wishes for 2019. We now move into private session.